This is a headgum podcast. thrilled to share this advanced screening of Westworld with you. We're very proud of it, and um, we hope that you geek out over it um, as much as we did. There's a lot to unpack in this new world, and we've gathered an incredible panel for post-screening discussion this evening, so you won't want to miss that. Um, a few people that I'd like to thank. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Su Chin Pak for moderating tonight's panel discussion. Um, Suchin Pak has been hosting and reporting for TV since she was 16, and many of you probably know her from MTV. Uh, in fall of 2015, she launched Open Account, a podcast where she searches for answers about why money is so universally thrilling, confusing, powerful, and stressful. Uh, I also want to thank Black Girl Nerds. Yes. Woo! Woo! Uh, Geeks Out, right. Uncanny Out. Magazine, yeah. and Gekin for participating in this event. Um, we really were so impressed and inspired by the spaces that you've created for your fans, um, your fan communities. These are spaces for enlightened discussion, for excited engagement, and where people can feel free to embrace who they truly are. Um, and your mere existence has added a bold and refreshing element to Greek culture, to geek culture. While we used to use comics and science fiction as forms of escapism, and often we still do, we now have places to connect with other people who share our interests and our anomalies. And my 13-year-old self thanks you for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so welcome to Westworld, a future space full of wild wonders and violent delights, where unimaginable things happen, and where you may find yourself wondering, what does it mean to feel alive? Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Well, that's, that's one way to end the evening. Hell yeah. <laughs> Heartbeat. Um, I'm Sujan Park. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Um, and I wanted to introduce um, all of our panelists here who are going to be answering some difficult and profound questions. We're going to solve the mysteries of the universe up here tonight. So. Um, I want to first introduce Lisa Bolakaha. Did I? Did I Bolakaja. Bolakaja. Well, there it is. I was close. I was very. I was trying to get. 
you know, sort of romantic with the silent J. Um, <laughs> she's a writer at Uncanny Magazine. She's also a screenwriter and a film critic. She co-hosts the popular Screenwriters Rant Room podcast. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, in the middle there is Amber Garza. Uh, she serves on the board of and writes for the LGBTQ nonprofit organization Geeks Out, uh, yes. which rallies, empowers, and promotes <laughs> queer geeks. So woo on that. Yes, we do. Um, <laughs> and Joelle Monique uh, is the co-creator and writer of the webcomic com- web Harsh Mellow. And she's also a podcaster with... Black Girl Nerds. Yes. Hey. Welcome, ladies. Thank you so much. Um, I think I have to start off with just sort of initial reactions. Listen, we've seen, we've all kind of gotten screeners, but it's a completely different experience when you're in a theater. Like, my heart is is still sort of beating in my throat. Um, so I just want to get briefly from you guys your first sort of initial reactions um, to watching this. Well, I'm glad that it's actually pretty brutal and dark. Um, <laughs> that's the kind of things that I like um, on top of that. But I'm also thinking my initial thought was, I know that I can, I, my debauchery runs deep. <laughs> and I'm not ashamed to say that. So part of me is thinking, like, if I went there, how, would I start to turn into the man in black? Like, how yeah. intense <laughs> would it be for me? So there's a lot of things going on in there yeah. but. Is it, yeah. well, how great is it though that there's like a, a space where you could do that, or you could just be wild and crazy oh, without there consequence? A, if there was an Idris five thousand, <laughs> I would not leave. <laughs> just live there, like I would, it. girl, I'd be a man on my porch going, "Hey, I love it, no. love it." She'd be yeah. bankrupt and, and yes. selling all her money at Westworld. Yeah. Yes, I like how many different themes we get to cover in a single episode, yeah. and how we're going to branch those out throughout the series, like. You know, when when does humanity begin and uh, God complexes, good, bad, advancing the species or not? We're not quite sure yet. Uh, uh, We have the horrible implications of what man can do uh, to women, especially when there are no consequences, which is horrifying and terrible. But then they're robots, but then they're also pretty lifelike, which is scary. There's a lot happening. I really like this. I really (laughs) can't wait for the show to start. It's going to be fun. Given that this is a fantasy world and, and that's... You know, that's the narrative, the simple narrative mm-hmm. that the visitors, um, the guests yeah. want to experience. You know, like they don't necessarily want anything too complicated. They don't want anything that's going to challenge them. Um, you know, uh, the man in black was talking to Dolores and he, and he said, oh, they put some spunk in you. I want you to fight back. But he doesn't really. Yeah. You know, right. he doesn't really want her to fight back. Just enough for him to win. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting as I was watching this and and um, we sort of laugh about it, about these sort of dark sides of who we are, that if we enter this park. But I was thinking on the flip side, where does love fall into this? Because there is that, the dark and the light that constantly plays throughout this show and I think throughout the season. But where do you think love fits into the picture of this? Well, it's just sad, you know, that people are going there to experience love. Like, that's what um, Bernard talks about, that that's why uh, the guests fall in love with the host. And that's just pathetic. And really, really, um, what is that love? Like, is that what people want? Is someone who's going to do exactly what they want to do and feed them the lines that they want to hear? Um, yes, I no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think so. That is exactly I how know, I would like. No, <laughs> no. I mean, there's, uh, it's, it's really, I, I think that the um, performance of love actually mm. makes it pretty sad. Mm. Yeah. There seems to be a love between the creators, not, not from the robots, but definitely to the creators, from the creators to the robots. They love their creations. They love the little intricacies. They love studying all these details, and I'm really fascinated by how deep does that love go? Like, what did old dude whisper to Robot as he's, like, walking into cold storage and he's, like, tearing up, and I'm like, this is really father-son or, like, uh, (laughs) mentor-mentee kind of moment (laughs) happening that we're not fully a part of, and I found that really interesting, so I'm interested to see how much further that goes. There's a small moment towards the end where the man in black, when he sees Dolores, remember he goes up to her after the Mm -hmm. beginning part where he, like, 
rapes and all those terrible things, but towards the end where he walks up to her and says, hey, Dolores, you know, this time I got things to do. And you can tell he's been going there, I think he says, for like 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I got like a little, maybe a little subtext of maybe when he first started going there, there might have been something he had with Dolores. But now he's, he's, but now it's like, it's, it's been perverted into something totally different. So there's like these weird twisted things. I don't know so much that they really love these things because they still see them as as things, I think. And well, I think he fell in love with her and he saw behind the curtain and he saw that the love that she was giving him was bullshit. Like it was it was performance. Mm-hmm. Like and that kind of uh aggressive male anger over being tricked, especially right. by a woman. Right. Um, that's it looks like that's what's and especially out. if the, they, they're changing the programs every so often you know like he might have been used to one thing and then he comes back and she's like a little smunky or like, by the way we have no idea what yeah, happens yeah. as you can see the rest yeah. <laughs> these, are just, these are just wild guesses so um, what, we had talked very briefly I don't know if you were in the room just even before we walked in here about an article that had, had come out about the series and how the writer had said that the robots become more human while the human become mm-hmm. less so. Oh, yeah. And I think that that, to me, is the most... Because it's like, who's, who's the human and who is not? Who is the loving and who is... It becomes... And, and when you talk about the man in black and, and maybe his relationship with Dolores, again, who's human there and who then is the non-human character? So what do you think about that kind of sort of dilemma or outcome of what happens when you interact with um, artificial beings that have possible intelligence. I almost feel like the character Bernard um, that Jeffrey Wright plays is, he kind of feels like to me as someone who's kind of losing a little bit of humanity. That's why he's so focused on little things that are details or ticks mm. or the reverences. Like he's been there too long. Yeah, and yeah. I feel like he's trying to recapture it. I almost feel like Dr. Ford is like, been there, done that, and he's kind of done. I mean, I, I just feel like when he's looking at his creations, just like the sadness, like in the very beginning when he's looking at, I think it's Wild Bill, the first one he created, it's almost like he's going to talk to Wild Bill because he remembers how things were and how maybe he was like the human and really, you know, I'm trying to create these real robotic things. And time has gone on, and he's lost that. And I feel like Ford and Bernard, you know, they're pretty intriguing to me, and I'm pretty curious how they're going to develop along the way. But, you know, that whole theme of, of course, the robots becoming more human, you know, I'm, I'm ready for that to happen because I feel like, you know, a lot of times uh, as we, in our society today, I feel like a lot of us are getting out of touch of what it means to be human it's so easy to get caught up in our social media and to interconnect with people, not one-on-one, but through, like, you know, social media and, you know, computers and things like that. I'm just really curious how this is going to play out through the rest of the series. You it's know? interesting to me because the writer guy kind of seems to already be pretty robotic, even though he's very <laughs> animated. Uh, he even has that line where he steps outside and is like, yeah, I thought you were a little son today, too. And so it's, like, mostly gone because, like, he missed it for the most part. <laughs> Um, and then he, he talks about staying up all night to rewrite these programs, and everyone that isn't a uh, main character that's kind of just uh, in the background seems always to be very diligently working and minding their task, and there's a very uh, uh, like hierarchical system of just checks and balances throughout. So I feel like we're already kind of, we start there yeah. with this very robotic kind right. of company. Um, all of you guys are writers and in this space, and many fans here of the sci-fi genre, I want to know how important or how do you balance when writing um, the issue of something that evokes feeling versus something that feels technologically or scientifically advanced? Do you know what I mean? I think so. I know. Uh, <laughs> you know? I don't know what you mean. Well, meaning that, like, for someone who isn't necessarily a sci fi fan myself, and I sort of had to look up a lot of these things that were here and, and where artificial intelligence is going and what is the recent sort of findings of that, and, and watching this, it's almost like, for me at least, it doesn't matter. Like, I don't have to, like, unravel the science of it because it feels mm. just like. Uh, you know, a romantic Western or a fucked up version of a romantic West. You know, so in writing that, I think I, I thought that to be quite interesting because this audience is quite aware and 
questioning and constantly in this conversation of like, where is technology? How realistic can this be? Where where do the glitches, so to speak, um, happen in the script? And then where do where do you or do you not sacrifice that for the feeling and the intent of what's happening I on think, screen? I think you want to, or at least just speaking personally, I try to write from a, a place that's emotional. There's a great quote, and of course I don't remember who said it, but there's no tears in the author's eyes, there's no tears in the person reading it. Like, you have to feel it. And then you, of course, want to be, uh, depending on your story as scientifically, you, you want to have your finger on the pulse. You want to know uh, where science is going, especially with something like this, where yeah. we have, like, like, we're not too far away from this. Like, we no. have Harry Potter land. Like, I can go pick up a wand and, like, have a fake <laughs> duel and eat in the castle and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. so I really don't feel like we're that far away from this. So I feel like you want to you wanna place it in a place that feels real. And then, for me, the science tends to come secondary. But, you know, we don't know how the robots are made. That's not really important. Uh, you know, how are they using orga- organic materials or not? We're not quite sure, like, what these things are made of. We just see a lot of machinery. So I don't know if I necessarily need to know. I feel it here. So it works for me. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, even the the most impactful science fiction is very grounded in human emotions and human experiences. And uh, I'm actually really, I hope that they get into sort of the science of how they make different things, because that is like the most advanced 3D printer in the entire (laughs) galaxy right now. Uh, But, and I'm, and I love, first of all, I just got to say something about the credits, HBO credits. What? Yes. That's so good. <laughs> uh, there was like the piano strings, and then there's a piano yes. playing, like just gorgeous. But um, in terms of what I, I love that quote about you know having tears in your eyes and making the reader cry um, because you know that is how it, it's when you're doing that you're being authentic. You know, right. like you're getting to the places that are painful and uncomfortable. And when you do that, it resonates. Um, If you're not doing that, readers are savvy, and they know, and they (laughs) are... We've all read bad science. <laughs> right. Yeah. One of the things I do also, I also, I'm a slush reader for Apex Magazine, so I'm constantly uh, reading a lot of science fiction and things that are coming through. And one of the things I have to say to, especially those who are writers who are writing science fiction, whether it's short stories or screenplays, there seems, you need to have a certain specificity and a certain humanity and a realness to it that'll make it pop. Because the worst science fiction is when it's all about the technology and all the techno babble and all oh, look all the you know the shiny toys that we have in, in space and things like that. But the stories that really resonate are those human stories that touch you. For example, I'm really curious about the character Maeve mm-hmm. in the thing and Clementine yeah. and a lot of those secondary characters that you see in the background where they're like doing things and you're, I'm I'm looking at them and I'm, I want to know what's that story, what's that narrative, that's something specific to them that's emotionally touching to me and there's a couple of scenes in this the show where I'm like I want to see what happens with that character because I'm having an emotional connection to them I think I'm engaged with them and there's times where um, I'm trying to think one of the scenes where uh, the little boy goes up to Dolores and says you're one of them aren't you and Dolores has that look on her face like what are you talking about and then you kind of the acting is so strong and you see that like oh, snap, she's about to have a moment. So I'm really curious about yeah. those emotional things. So that's what makes really good science fiction. Well, that, that's great, because I was going to ask each of you guys, which character are you most interested in seeing develop, and in, in what way and why? Jeffrey Wright's character, because I love Jeffrey Wright. <laughs> the Patch, that's my favorite person on the planet. Um, but aside from that, he's got secrets. That guy's got secrets, deep buried things he's working on and I want to know what's making him tick um yes him Dan Newton's character yeah the like madam she especially with seeing what's ahead <laughs> she she's such a badass um, I would say her skin is amazing her skin is amazing. Yes. I mean let's just end the duels and when she's like yeah. shooting the cowboy people and you're just like that is so sexy oh that shot right you're so the sexy girl just comes oh yes. yeah Thank you, Thank you, Yeah, and also I'm I'm curious about the man in black because I I you know I I, I go to the dark side because they have cookies and <laughs> I I want to know because a part of me connects to that and I want to know how you know 
there's this na- this, this notion in the, in the series and right now when I'm saying thematically is this idea of toying with the idea of sin is mm. and for me sin is very subjective because something that might be sinful for you might be okay for me right and it seems like in this world where there's really no consequences to your actions okay you can do anything you want I want to know where he got to that point. But why would you go there for 30 years? Like, how is your life so awful in the real world that you got to spend so much loot to come here and to, like, experience that? And I think a part of me wants to see that because it's something in myself that I see, why I'm attracted to dark things, why I'm attracted to things that might be violent, which in real life is against my nature, but in, you know, my secondary life is something I might want to do. You know, I'm just Your curious. Second life. My second life. That's probably such a great place for serial killers. Like, honestly, like, just get in there, get it all out of your system, come back in six weeks when you have the urge again. Like, I'm really intrigued to see, I'm really intrigued to see some more of the guests. Like, yeah. who comes here? Like, we know this guy's here for three years, but who else is a frequent visitor? Like, and al- and also the family. Like, who brings their family? Like, I'm sitting there watching them like, did you not walk to the town? No, but we didn't. Uh, uh, and see what went down. You know, like, and you bring a junior? And you bring a junior? Oh, come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! They didn't the cross the river. They didn't cross the river. People of color river. don't want to go back. Like <laughs> I'm not trying. Travel, which is why it fascinates me because they can't hurt me. In theory. That's true. Because if it was if it, if it was time travel, no. black people, natives, we're not going back. <laughs> we max. <laughs> No. Robots, fake world, like, right. that's a safe space where we can go, like, explore and, like, try things out. And the they explain that, like, you know, if you stay close here and don't go out after dark, like, it's safe, it's fun. Take the kids. It's good times. And we're not, like you said before, uh, Sujan, you said we're not that far away from this. Because right now, a lot of us, right now, when we go home and leave here, we're going to be playing these video games just like this. Yeah. The only thing that's different is, like, it's real-life people. And if you give people that, they're going to want to do that. And a part of me is really curious to know the type of people who want, like he said, there's their, there's the town. And like the one guy said, well, you know, there's the town, but stuff levels up when you get out of town. Like, I want to know about the people who want to level up and go the outskirts. Yes. And when we saw those, those clips. And does that cost extra? <laughs> it always does. It always, it always does. does. Um, so, right. Yeah, I, you know, something that interesting that you were just saying about this whole man in black and how he's been coming for 30 mm-hmm. years. And, you know, um, I, I keep I keep circling around the circles. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like if he keeps coming back to this, and this is more real to him than possibly his real life. Exactly. Then this isn't this his... Real life. real life, yeah. I mean, isn't that, to me, that's what makes me want to, like, hide under the covers and, and sort of rock myself to sleep because it's like, well, what, you know, these dark fantasies, is that more you than not? I mean, I don't know. That's, isn't there, it all the, you? Yeah, there are many subcultures yeah. where people feel like they come alive, you know, whether it's sexual subcultures where or just anything, in fandom, whatever, where a lot of times some people... Their real life is not their real life. Their yeah. real life is whatever mask or thing that they put on to become who they think they are. You know, for a lot of people, putting on a mask is revealing who they are. Right? Hi, cosplayers. What's up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I also think we talked about this a little bit about, for me, maybe not being so, you know, in the science world of it, watching this the plausibility isn't so far off. You know right. what I mean? I'm not sitting there being like, I, I just can't make that leap. Mm-hmm. They did a really great job of kind of walking that fine line between what is just on the other side of where we are and where we are today. So, one, what do we think about that and, and just sort of the wor- world as we live in, you know, is there a piece of technology or science that makes you sort of step back and wonder, well, maybe this is where we stop playing God or... Maybe this is where we draw the line. You're, in the real world? Like, yeah, in the real world. She's like, no, no I want to hide this. Like, scientists, that's their nature. Yeah. And they're, that's both a good thing and a bad thing. I think part of what this might be approaching, mm. perhaps, maybe, <laughs> is science without ethics and science without morality right. yeah. and science for the sake of just doing it without thinking about what the consequences mm-hmm. are, which happens. Um, but... Uh, you know, and they were um, the security officer, the woman, she was talking about, you know, there's another thing going on here. And I think that was one of the things we were going to talk about. 
And immediately my mind goes to, it's defense. It's something having to do with the military and killing people on a massive scale. Or, you know, like, they're soldiers. They could be soldiers that are put out and they're just cannon fodder. So, um, yeah, it's with, with science especially, that's been the great... Um, conflict, mm. you know, like, and even in fiction, like Frankenstein, you know, like mm-hmm. Frankenstein's monster, you know, he created life, yeah. but at what cost? And, you know, we all know that story. Yeah. I just feel like you can't know where the line is until you cross it. Mm. Um, so I just feel like, you know, not yet. But then once you cross it, you backpedal. It yeah. happens. <laughs> You're just like, sure, too far. Yeah, you, just move, you just move the line Sorry about a little that. bit further. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Which is well, what we tend to do anyway with science. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's interesting to me because for me then it, it comes back to this idea of sin, mm-hmm. right? So this is a world presumably where sin has no consequences. That can be argued as we saw in the previews. Um, but then I go back to, well, the original sin then perhaps is even creating this whole thing. You know what I mean? Like what is... for. For me, that is like a big head trip because, yes, science will push us forward, but there is a large part of me that believes that maybe that pushing forward feels wrong Mm. innately. I don't know. It will feel wrong to some people, um, but it won't feel wrong to other people. And sometimes that's just the curiosity, Mm -hmm. just the, you know, where can we go with this, you know, the limits of human achievement, like... Um, what um, Dr. Ford was saying, you know, um, we this is it. This we is good. It. This, this is, is good as good as we're gonna get because yeah. there's no what he's talking about where there's uh, medicine has reached a point at which there's no real disease. Mm-hmm. Age doesn't matter, and he's right in that you know um, natural selection and evolution stops at that point because how can it yeah. evolve from that? Robots. <laughs> so, well, then, yeah. Yes. Well, Joelle, maybe you, you want to pick that up because I think that this whole question of artificial intelligence and robots and how do you how do you all feel about that? We're already using artificial intelligence every day right now, whether you're Googling something, the self-driving cars, whether I'm sitting in my house and I'm talking to my computer and saying, set my alarm, do this, make sure you wake me up at such and such a time. And it's already, it's here. Okay. It's. It's not like it's coming, you know, it's already here. The only thing that's going to be different is the advancement of it, how, you know, just how more advanced it's going to be. So a lot of times people have these fears of artificial intelligence. They think about Terminator, they're going to turn against us. But historically, looking at science fiction and just science in general, um, technology, this is my personal opinion, I'm just putting this out there. (laughs) You can tweet at me later if you want to. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, on Twitter. She's great. I, there's always, I always feel like it's not technology, it's always man that's yeah. always the problem. And a lot of times we put these, we push these ideas on technology being this horrible thing, and artificial intelligence is going to make it terrible. But I think about things like, for example, the robot Pepper that was created a couple of years ago to be created as a companion for people, where this robot basically, it learns from you, it learns your emotions, and it learns how to connect with you, and I feel like that's something that, in the future, people might need that for companionship. A lot of us aren't having children. A lot of us don't have families that are close by, and we may need to have that companion. Some of us are extreme introverts, and the only connection we have might be to things that are like being on social media, but not actually being in front of people. Maybe we need that. People who may have autism may need to have these artificial intelligent companions, because that's how they, they work at it. So I always always get kind of, not annoyed, but I'm always kind of chuckling to myself and I think about people like, technology is going to take over and be horrible. And it's like, no, no, it's man that's horrible. And how we use technology, that's what makes it awful. So when I see stuff like, you know, Westworld, like, oh, it's, they're doing terrible things. And it's like, like yeah, but there's a reason why. Because we messed up. <laughs> and you probably had it coming. Yeah. <laughs> Go get him, Maeve. Stab him, stab him. I, I want to sort of uh, wrap it up and, and ask a, a final question then. And um, Lisa, you sort of answered it, and you can maybe expand on it if you want, is then what is the larger game that they keep alluding to? You know, they keep alluding to the management interests versus mm-hmm. the guest interests, and what is this larger game that is being played? And then you have the man in black with the maze and that. Yeah. 
Uh, well, it's kind of like, or, or the quote, you yeah. know, where it talks about, you know, the the Shakespeare quote from Romeo and Juliet, where it talks about violence. Right. Meets violence. right. Mm-hmm. Um, when you suggest and create a world that's nothing but violence, all it can do is level up. Mm-hmm. And it's going to turn against you. So I feel like through the first pilot episode we're seeing, there's a lot of foreshadowing. Little touches. And this is for the screenwriters in the room. Y'all notice the little things with the flies constantly going through? And the last line that um, Dolores says, like, if they asked her, did you ever kill anything? Oh, I haven't. And the last thing we see... (laughs) Right? Little touches in there. The music throughout, the Rolling Stones... You know, Paint It Black. The last song with Johnny Cash at the end, that the original Man in Black, if you know anything about your country <laughs> music. So there are things that are being, yes, like, you know, the writer in me is like keying into that, those sort of things. And so all it's doing is like, you see this world where you can go and be violent, guess what? It's coming back on you and it's coming back hard. The clap back will be real. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about, like, I... I like the theory of it being military, but we don't have any signs of government yet, which may usually symbolize military. We have private militarized institutions, so it's possible. But they gave you so much emotional death. Yeah. I'm curious, what are you really here for? Like, mm. And Jeffrey Wright's character doesn't seem violent or malicious to me yet. Could change. He was great in Boardwalk Empire. Um, yeah. But he, uh, I, I kind of wonder if maybe there is a more cynical mm. like thing. Because... How could you tell if they just release these things into society? Mm. Yeah. There'd be no way for you to know. Like, they bleed. Like, they can eat. They can consume spies. liquids. And spies. Yeah, they would be excellent spies. Right. They can upload their no stuff terror. right before they die. It's incredible. Right. But I, even more sinister, like, on an individual, personal level. Yeah. Your emotional depth to me says more than weaponry. So make sure to see where it goes. Mm. I see it as, I, I actually see Jeffrey Wright, um, Bernard, and Dr. Ford. I don't think they're in step with the rest of the company. Like they have a different I think that, agenda. well, they definitely yeah. have a different agenda. Um, you know, Dr. Ford, is, he, wants, he, he wants to be God. I mean, he's already God to some degree, but he's talking about, you know, these, uh, the reveries mm-hmm. that he implanted. Uh, those are... The glitches; those are the mutations that are going to lead right. to something else, right. and those were on purpose. I right. think. I think those are not mistakes. It's him, maybe, just pushing, you know, the envelope enough to make those mistakes. Yeah, well, he knows that's, yeah right. right, exactly. And um, I mean, it makes them more like real people. Um, but in terms of, you know, what they're motives are versus what the what management is mm-hmm. because I don't think they're part of management. Yeah. Um, I I mean I like the spy idea. I hadn't even thought about that mm-hmm. until now. Well thank you guys so much for adding so thank much you. Thank you. Yes, lively chatter about this and of course we'll all be along for the ride together. So we'll follow each other virtually. Um, and thank you guys for joining us tonight and staying through our conversation. That was a HeadGum Podcast.